Okay, my friends, this is going to be about a ramble about the past history of how I started into the mud fossils and about this guy here, Scott Walter, how he literally destroyed our research in 63 seconds on national TV representing the history channel America on Earth. He destroyed our research. He's totally wrong and he owes us a, a huge apology and history channel and I want to put on TV somewhere spread through that they made a mistake. It was an honest mistake and they are apologizing for destroying our research. Now I went back and forth with Scott and um, it ended up being a little contentious as it always does and um, now the evidence is, is uh, indisputable so we want an apology and he totally destroyed the research where it could have been exposed to a lot of people on TV in 63 seconds okay so again this is Scott Walter he's working for the History Channel and he should give us an apology now this guy's not happy with him he calls him Scott Walter is or whatever that word is con con artist now I'm not saying he is at this point in time this was not accepted I understand that this goes back to about 2014 I believe maybe 2015 but it was early 2015 sometime 2014 I can't remember but Jim presented this head to Scott Walter and in 63 seconds on national TV first time he ever saw it, he looked at it nope that's fake Somebody just carved it, it's nothing. Now, where did I show you this head? There's no way in the world he's right. And we deserve an apology, and we want an apology, and I want it on TV. And I think Jim may not even be with us anymore. This goes back over 10 years ago, and he was kind of elderly at that point, and I'm getting there, so I won't be here much longer either. So I want this handled, and I want the damn thing handled now. <clears throat> now, this could get very boring, because it could take more than a minute and three seconds. This is the head. All this stuff, this is DNA tested and validated 100%. And this is the kind of preservation that happens. Other preservation is exquisitely perfect, just like a piece of meat you could put on your plate. We have new species, no toes. Again, nobody will look at this because they're people like Scott Walters. Oh, I know what I'm talking about because my professor told me to say these words. Well, your professor should have told you to take some chemistry and some biology and some anatomy and understand nucleophilic substitution and the invasion and, and how blood is made from iron primarily and these are the oxidation states of iron which is when it's red it's arterial blood and it's good and it's pumped up with a lot of oxygen when it's black it's already in the vein because it's all the oxygen used up. Now there's another thing that's called bone black and that is inside a bone the which is a, here's a here's a mud fossil bone bone. Now inside is a black. You see the black? See how black that is? That's bone black. And this still has a little taste of bone. I showed this in a microscope the other day. But that's the bone black, and that's inside of a bone. That's the bone is cracked. That's why there's so much bone black here. You still have black inside the regular vein and artery network, but inside the bone where the marrow is, you got some serious black. And this is a bone, another mud fossil bone. That's mud fossils. Mud fossils are not misunderstood, not are totally understood. And Scott owes Jim an apology. Any gentleman would do that. He'd say, Jim, let me take another look at it. Let's get the History Channel who put Scott on TV and in a minute and three seconds dismissed all of our work. And uh, it's not right. And Jim, I mean, um, Scott, as a scientist, should step up and say, wait a minute, let's take another look at this and let's put it back on TV and look at it. And I want to be involved in that because I worked with Jim very carefully. Now, who would carve a nose like this? Just think about this. You see that nose? 
somebody stepped on that nose and split it wide open and there's blood coming out of the edge of it. That's blood. That's not just red there for nothing. And that also is blood up there where it came out and the blood red and black. Everybody that knows mud fossils knows the red and black. And the yellow is the in-between blood. Now you usually see that in the heart area and stuff where it's, it's filtering back and through in the lungs. But in, in the regular body, you always see just red and black. Because that's all it's there. The, the, <clears throat> the yellow is, is in flux. That, and Jim said he could take a card. I never had this in my hands. I don't want to make any false claims here. I never had this in my hands. I don't need to. I don't need to. This could easily be found where the veins and arteries are in the neck. But the problem is, Jim let it dr be dry. That's dry. That's not the way to do it. You need these things soaking wet. And then you can see the red would turn really red and the black would turn really black. I do this all the time, but trust me, I know what I'm talking about. And um, if this was checked correctly, you should be able to find the veins and arteries that feed up to the neck because they're going to be there. Now, they might have to be, you know, they might have been eroded enough on the edge where you can't see them. You might have to chisel in there a little bit to find them, but they're going to be there, and they're going to be anatomically in the exact places they're supposed to be. They're absolutely going to be there. No question whatsoever. So, Scott, you owe Jim an apology, my friend. All right, this is truly amazing. This is the, the uh, meteorite came through space. That's my contention. It's magnetic and that has the bone. Now you see the colors? And you see all that gritty looking stuff, all those little bumpy stuff? That's what's in the blood. That is what was in the blood. That didn't come from somewhere else. That was in the blood that when it burnt up they turned into these chunks of minerals. Now guess what? I made the same thing. Well, sort of. <laughs> It didn't come through space. You see what I did with this here? This was with chicken tissue. Now, I reconnoitered that it had something to do with electricity. And when I did this, and this wasn't long, this was only like three months or so, I put this in salty waters. I didn't add any silica. I didn't know about the silica at this time. This was way, way, way back. And I put in tell you're a current and you say oh Roger what's tell you're a current well the earth gets hit with electricity it's a literally electricity coming down in a form of of light it's electricity it's electricity that's all it is and it's called a telluric currents and they come down through the soils and through whatever they have to get through to get into the earth ground so I used a battery and I attached it up here somewhere and down here somewhere, I don't know. But you see what happened? It formed all these same looking things as up in that, that other shot, which was, was this one up here. Now, of course, that came through space, so it, it, it cooked, that's why it's so black. But other than that, you got all those minerals have sort of been driven into coalescing together with each other. Just like this down here. There's no reason that that should be like that. You see all these little crystals? Those are crystals form. Crystals form because they're, in this case, being driven by electricity as far as I can determine. You know, it's, this is still an open question, a lot of this, but I, to me, it needs to be looked at. So that was my first attempt at making mud fossils. And I just did another one. It's been going on for about a year. It was with silicates and complete bodies. This was just chicken from like you buy at the store. I think it was a wing or something. I don't know. But um, you need to have all the blood in them and you the enzymes and all that stuff to do the right job. And then it's got to be basically boiled or at least cooked for an extended amount of time, simmered in heavy silicates with salt. And that opens up everything and invades it and stabilizes it. And then when they dry out, they're mud fossils. 
All right, remember how the nose was bleeding on the side? Well, that's because that's a fleshy area. It has blood. In here, it is just basically cartilage. And then there's, there's a little bit of muscle wrapping on there. And I believe that's what we saw around that cartilage on the nose. So what do we got here? Well, we got the book I wrote, which was Mud Fossils, which that is a mud fossil. And Velikovsky, who recorded all these events that led to the creation of mud fossils and mines in collision. The, the PhDs and all these guys that I have a degree in this, I'm an archaeologist, I'm a paleontologist. Well, who cares? If I can come up with the evidence, which we did, and then it's dismissed in one minute and three seconds. Is that a valid, legitimate investigation of what was presented? No, it is not. And is that a valid archaeologist or whoever he thinks he is? No, it's not. He's not a geologist. He's not anything. He's just a dismisser of, of what puts in front of his face. Now, I'll show you. There is no question whatsoever this thing is valid and real. And it can be tested now. Hopefully, somebody will eventually do this. You know, Jim spent a bunch of money trying to get this cat, well, he got a cat scan down to the University of Texas after they fought like crazy. And that ended up almost going legal because they scanned it and it was the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. And they refused to say one word to me after that. Never, absolutely no discussion whatsoever. Now, at that point, I think Jim lost a lot of confidence in me and he, we haven't really discussed too much since. But I really kept going after things and it ended up getting very, very contentious. And especially between me and Yale and me and um, University of Texas Austin, very contentious. Now let me show you why I say that's real. All right, so here's Scott Walter. Jim opens up his case, takes out the head, puts it down. This is 3718. Scott's looking at it. Now remember, 3718 is when he started looking at it. This is the first second he put eyes on it. <clears throat> Actually, 3723. And he's getting ready to put it down, and Scott says, wow. Now he just took it and he twisted it over. It's 3732. So from 3723 to 732, that's about 10 or 12 seconds. All right, so at 37, 34, or 35, he's already made up his, his mind of what it is, and he's asking Jim, what is your interpretation of this? So we're up to 37, 34. So 37, 23 to 37, 34, that's about uh, 11 seconds. Now, Jim is thinking it's a giant, maybe a young giant, because that's his interpretation, which I don't agree with. It's just a, a guy, not too big. I, don't, I didn't see it as being exceptionally large. Now, Jim worked with me fabulously. I told him, I, I, I said, this is real. There's no question about it. The iron oxides are absolutely 100% certain what you have is a real human head. And I figured we, sooner or later we would get this through, but nothing helped. I had DNA tests and CAT scans, everything in my own stuff. He had a, his CAT scan down at University of Texas, ended up in an absolute nightmare. You wouldn't believe what happened. It, it, it went legal, actually, because of me. I was the one doing everything. Jim is a real mild-mannered guy. He didn't put up a fuss or anything. I would have said, wait a minute, pal. You better start looking at this. And I would have pointed out all the things, but he didn't do that. So now don't forget, he's only had 11 seconds to make his determination of what that head is. Okay, Scott says, to be honest, he's going to respectfully disagree. That Jim says it's a real head, which I, it is. It's 100% for certain. Okay, Jim brought up a couple of points and said, what about this, what about that? And Scott said at this point, he says, this to me without any doubt is a sandstone head. That was it. Now that was at 3826. The first time he saw it was 3723. So if you go 3723 to 3826, he has examined that for a minute and three seconds. 
Now, this was on national TV, and I took a, a, a offense at this. I said, uh, Scott, as you, you got to re-examine this. You, we got to start talking about this. Do you understand about iron and iron ore and the black and the red, the different states of iron? One of them comes out of the bone and out of veins, and one of them is the artery blood. No, 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 I know what I'm doing. I'm a geologist, and you don't know, I have any idea what you're doing. I said, no, J Scott. I really, I've tried to be nice, but it ended up being kind of contentious, which it always ends up being. They can never, ever, ever stop and think. I haven't found one of them that did it, and he was as bad as any of them. He was worse. And this is on national TV, destroyed it. Absolutely destroyed the research. Thank you, Scott. He's showing this, which is blood. He's saying this feature here is actually some iron staining. But what is made? What is blood made out of, Scott? And plus it has the red and the black. That's the two different states of iron, which is a used blood and the fresh blood, the red blood. You see, I just showed you Scott Walter. This is the head. That's the head right there. I wrote this book because I was so pissed off. Nobody would pay, pay any attention whatsoever. Scott put a whole minute and three seconds into his research. Yale and all the rest of them, they didn't want anything to do, absolutely refused. Not a single word from them, other than just go away, leave us alone, we won't look at it. Now I'm going to show you this, and again, I wrote this book back in 20, February 2016, and showing that these things could fossilize, and they were mud fossils. And then Yale, they also wrote a paper, and I sent all this to Yale, and they wrote the paper at the end of 2016, saying, yes, exceptional preservation soft body cre created by silica-rich oceans. Well, the whole world was an ocean because it was the Great Flood. And Scott Walters, I went back and forth with him, and it didn't end up well. And again, never does, ever. All right, I'm going to detail this out extremely well, but this was less than a minute, I think it was a minute and three seconds from the time he first laid eyes on this head till the time he says this to me without any doubt is a sandstone head. And he just left it at that. And Jim said, well, uh, they, they had a couple of things and in about another 15 seconds later, it was all over and he wanted to talk about something else. And on national TV, I want this put back on national TV and say there's been new research that indicates that this is quite likely real. Now, I don't even know if Jim is still alive. We lost touch with each other, but he told me to. I was free to use anything that I wanted to say about his head. I did more research than anybody. I didn't actually touch it, but nobody would touch it. And I didn't want to go down to Kentucky. Now, it, it was actually found by a guy named Arlie Caudill in a riverbank. And that's what happens. They get in that mud and they just nucleophilic substitution. I've, I totally understand the process now. And it depends on what kind of, of material surrounded it. This was in flesh. This was completely surrounded with flesh. And it just took on the same texture, I mean the same nucleophilic invasion, which is the transition metals, just made it red, iron, just like it would be in the body. Now, if it was in a different condition, like this bone, it turned into mudstone. This was in, a, in what was, was called the red bed, and that was all boiled flesh. It was literally mud. That's what boiled flesh is. It boiled out of the creature's bodies. I have all the evidence to support this, and Velikowski was the same thing. The book I wrote, as you'll see, was about this whole episode here, and it actually shows this head, and that was back in 2015. Now, this bone here turned to, to mud, mudstone, but it's a, obviously clearly a bone. But no, even Yale at first, just rocks. Well, I think they still, they've never corresponded back again. And they destroyed my research too. University of Austin, same thing. No, no science out there, no researchers out there. All they care about is trying to find some funding. And Yale did. They got funding to look into this from NASA, who I contacted about this because it's up on Mars. This is a nightmare where we're in. I'm telling you right now, academia has completely lost it. And they have, they, it's, it's a come to an end for them. 
All right, watch this extremely carefully. This is a cap. This is not his hairdo. His nose was crushed like somebody stepped on it. That's red blood. That's blood. This is actually cartilage. You see that? That's, if you looked at this very carefully, you would see that's the cartilage, and then this tissue surrounds it. Now, whatever happened there, whether it was poked with a sword or something, I don't know. But that went through the bone, and there's some blood, and the black is what's, I call it bone black. Now, it's, it's, what's, it's marrow, okay? It's down inside, like, in other words, this is a bone too. And it's basically the same thing as that. Only this is more dried out. He, he, that's why he couldn't tell much. If he put water on here, it would just poof. Now, you see in, in the middle where the marrow is, you got black. Same thing here. Same up there. His head is crushed in. And it looks like they did it with some kind of a mallet, like a big broom. Now, this was knitted. This cap was knitted. If you look at this, somebody that knows knitting, have them just take a look at that edge up there. And do they see the, the knitting pattern? All right, and this is right down across his forehead. It, his hair wasn't cut like that. Now, over here, Jim told me, and again, I did not touch this. I have not ever touched this head. But I don't need to touch it. I understand. He could put a playing card right up through that crack there. This is like a cap. It's just a cap the guy had on and they killed him and left him dead there. It looks to me he must have got hit in the head. Maybe a horse kicked him or something. I don't know what happened to him. But he was dead, and that's his head. So I guess you'd call him a deadhead. And these are the colors of, of iron oxides. Now, Scott Walter, should know, he should know that. I mean, it's just, it's, just, it's just undeniable. And all of these little features, to dismiss this in 63 seconds on national TV, it's a, without an apology here, I, I, that's just not fair at all. It's not fair at all. And these guys spent a bunch of money, too, to, to get this validated. And that ended up with an absolute nightmare with me and uh, University of Texas in Austin. Absolute nightmare. And Jim and Arlie spent, I, I think, a lot of money. I think they wanted twelve hundred fifty dollars to scan that, and um, I wouldn't have paid it because it, it was. But anyway, that's another whole other issue. But you know, I led him down that path, thinking that all we got to do is get this validated. Well, nobody would validate. Nobody even look at it. So I just never expected this. So I apologize to Jim and Arlie, and I haven't had any contact with them. Arlie's, I mean, Jim's um, email's not working anymore, so I don't know if he's even still with us. I, but this is the kind of issue you get when people just won't pay any attention. There's no way you can deny this. Look at that. That's the cartilage. Nobody carves a nose all splayed back and puts a little red square here and some iron oxide there where his head's caved in. No, that doesn't happen. And that black is because of the black blood that comes out of bones. You know, you got a skull around you and inside the skull there's that, that black blood, primarily. All right, let me show you the difference between dry and wet when you look at something. Right now, this is dry, and it's, you know, it's just, it's not eye-catching. You can't see a lot of details, a lot of colors. When you hydrate something, it gives off colors. All right, that's what you're looking at right there, is that's a little um, iron meteorite. And all of those little holes are where the alveoli are, and they're blown out, and that's a little magnet just to show you that it's iron. Now, we're going to go right up here into the microscope. I'm going to show you the difference between something that's wet and something that's dry. That right now is dry, and that's an iron meteorite. And all that black stuff is because it's all cooked up in that area. Let me focus it in a little better.
All right, you see that black stuff and the little white, little flaky stuff in there? And then you see all this little brownish looking stuff. That's when it's dry. All right, and this is a little, little redder in this area. But every one of those was an alveoli. When this heated up so hot that it started to turn into iron, all those bubbles exploded outwards. Those aren't craters going in. That's the bubbles exploding out, and that's what's left over inside there is, is literally the leftover of the blood. Now, I'm going to put some water on here, and then we'll look at it. All right, don't forget, that's what it looks like now. Okay, now I'm going to put a little water on her. You see? Now I'm going to let that settle in for a minute. Hold on, let me get it flip, make sure it's nice and flush with the water. It'll take a minute or two to settle in, and then you see the color change. <laughs> Alright, you see this? It's still a little shiny because of the water, but as you go up here, every one of those holes is blown out. They're not just pocked, they're like pockets. They literally popped because every one of those was an alveoli. Now let's come way down to the end of the lung here. And you see all this here? You see that? That's the fabric of what the lung in most places would have been covered with. And that's, again, I will show you the one I have here that was DNA tested. It's just saturated with that stuff. But that's the cheap stuff it burns off. What you see here, black, that's, that's literally iron now. That black is iron. Now, on top of this being an iron lung coming out of space, it has the spur lock on it. That's it right there. That's the spur lock. And I'm going to back it up. This is the lung, and there is this exact same attachment they all have. It's got that little thing. It's not a face of anything. It looks like that. I know. Everybody's, oh, that's a face. Then this is a really gnarly spot. You see back there? This is what locks it into the lung. Other than that, this is just a little tiny lung that came through space. And that is the spur lock. It's, it's totally obvious. Now, all of this stuff, you see the little white particles here? Let me put a little more water on there. You see how bloody red that is? That's the spurlock. Now, give that a second to dry up a little bit. You see those little white fibers? They're supposed to be everywhere on this lung. I mean everywhere. This should be like a rubber bag. I did see some other places they didn't burn up quite so much. Right up in this area here. Hold on. You see what a difference it makes when you put a little water on something? You see those flakes? That's what the lung was supposed to be completely coated with. When that burnt off, this ended up being iron. You know, not not solid iron. You can see there's still a ton of blood in there. I mean a lot of blood. This thing's saturated with blood. You see that? And this is iron. And that's why the, the red blood smelts into iron. And, that's, and, and of course these holes go down into all the other alveoli. And don't forget the little white fibers. Now let me show you a lung that didn't smelt. It was the one I had DNA tested. It's much bigger than this one. The beauty of this is this lung was small enough not to completely melt. I have one another meteorite lung that's even smaller than this. And it also has the spur lock. And it's virtually identical to this, but it's much less magnetic because it's smaller. The bigger that they are, the more they smell. The more they smell, the more magnetic they get. It's just a, a ratio. A small one comes through very, almost no magnetic, and, and it just cooks up a little bit. And uh, although I did have one that's very strange, and it's a bone, extremely magnetic, but lighter than hell. And the reason is the bone itself didn't cook. It's just the blood boiled out of the bone and turned like really magnetic. I'll show it to you. See how cool this is? These are both almost identical. 
literally identical. And they both had the spur locks. That has one right there, and this is one right here. I showed you in a microscope. And they're both filled with holes. Now, they're both magnetic, but very, this one's very weakly magnetic. You see all the holes? The same as this. It's exactly identical almost. Almost identical. <laughs> but it's not, not very magnetic. This one here easily captures a couple of little magnetic balls. Whoops. This one here, it'll hold on to two. This one here holds on good. This one, much less magnetic. See how? And, and that's a product of coming through space. And the, the more they, bigger they are, the more they smelt. Now, this is a meteorite bone. This right here, I'll show you in the microscope. This is just bone. And that right there is the marrow, and it is magnetic. I mean, it's, it's every bit, whoops, it's every bit as magnetic as the lung, this bigger lung. But it's a little tiny thing, and it just hardly weighs anything. The, and, and the only thing that's magnetic is that spot, because that's where the blood is. Over here, there's no magnetism at all. None. Zero. None. And over here, it's, it's quite magnetic. So let's take a look at this in the microscope. What I'm pointing out is the things that should be known by the archaeologists and, and geologists and astrophysicists and all these people. They need to, to, to move into other areas of understanding. Because you, you can't just look at a rock and say, oh yeah, that's a igneous, that's a metamorphic, that's a sedimentary. Well, big deal. Yeah, plus, it's not right in the first place. <laughs> they show a big thing of tendon. It's like this thick with layer after layer after layer after layer of tendon. And they say 150 million years in one picture. No, it was about two days when the thing died. It's just the way it works. These things were just off the charts enormous. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. All right, that's the bony meteorite. This is the bone. Now, you see down here, that's where blood just blew out of there. Because it cooked off, this is in the marrow side. Now, I'm going to try to get a shot of the bone itself. This is the side, it's just bone. You see it? It's just bony substance. And then you come over there, and that's where it started to cook the blood. So there's an extreme transition. You see from the white to the black, and the black is, is the blood. And the blood has turned, because it came through space. You, know, you can't make this happen on Earth. You've got to get to such extreme temperatures. That bone should be cinder. And it's not. And the only way this can happen is because this thing like floated down from space through that temperature and it cooked all of the moisture and just turned it into metals. You see? Now something funny here, when I looked at this, I did an experiment, whoops, and I could see spots on this that look ex almost identical to the experiment I did. Hold on a second. All right, look at this. Now, just look at the texture of this and the different mineral inclusions. All those little, like, rocky-looking things. That's what's in blood. Let me show you what I did. Basically, what we're seeing in the guy's nose is this, which is the muscle. There's the the cartilage is right here basically and the muscle is basically wrapped around the cartilage and then above that is the skin and the flesh just pushed off on the sides and as I showed you in the last shot that that chunk of um, flesh was there which allowed it to bleed in that spot you see it and it only bled right there you see there? 
No, you can't. Right there. That's where it bled, right off to the side. Now, I think I showed you the other shot. And that was a few clicks over this way. Now, basically right there. So that's what that's why we're seeing those little lines across the nose of that. Now again, that's Jim's head, and that's my book I wrote because I was so upset about the whole. I was I was furious about the response from academia and from people like Scott Walter. I was off the wall, crazy furious. I wrote this book, but it's only ninety nine cents. I didn't want. I never made a penny on this. It's just I just want to make sure people understand. This is just nonsense, what we're being handed from academia. And people like Scott Walter. And the people in our national laboratories and NASA and all the rest of them. They don't really care, as far as I can determine, about reality. Either that or they're so incompetent, it's just hard to believe the, incompetent, the level of incompetence. It can't be. It can't, it's just impossible. So what is the alternative, the alternative motive? I don't know, you think of one. All right, I love you all.